want to recognize Dean Anderson, Dean Patel, and Dean Cal Caliendo. They do so much for us, and we're so grateful. Um, thank you. The faculty department heads, if you could all stand, we'd want to recognize you as well. For any faculty department heads or faculty? Thank you. Um, the National Advisory Board members, if we could have you stand as well. Thank you for all the effort you put in to the Huntsman as well. And one of, us, one of them will speak to us today, Holly. We're excited to hear from her. Um, the WEBA Presidency Board members and, and advisors, they put in a lot of work this summer, um, and we're excited to get WEBA up and running. And then we want to make a special shout out to the lovely ladies who made this all possible um, and who did all the little gifts and uh, so, so many things for us. If we could have Chantel, Heather, and Tanya raise their hands or stand up so we can recognize them. I don't know if they're here, but we, appreci we appreciate you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, if you could take out your booklets, I'll just go over the agenda with you real quickly. Um, First, we'll hear from our keynote speaker, uh, Lindsay Ballenquist, and I'll introduce her in a second. Thank you for coming, Lindsay. Um, after that, we'll have a panel discussion, and that will be from our professors and our uh, board member, Holly, and we will learn from them and ask them questions. So be thinking of questions you want to hear from the board. Um, and then during that time as well, we'll have a little raffle and give out some prizes for those of you that registered, um, and it'll be great. Along with that, you'll find your True North page with notes. Um, so we want you to take notes during this meeting. I think that we uh, retain information a lot better when we write it down. So if you want to take notes, write down feelings you have, goals that you have, that would be awesome. Um, and then finally, there's this mentorship page where there's a list of all the mentors and how to contact them. Um, and I'm a, so my name is Olivia Archibald. Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Olivia Archibald, and I will graduate next year with a finance degree. Um, and mentorship has been crucial to me throughout college. Um, there have been professors that have played such a big role in me getting internships, um, me having the confidence to apply for those internships. It just, and even looking up to other students has been um, such a blessing and has really, um, I feel like guided me throughout my college career. So that mentorship page is a huge resource. So be sure to reach out to those ladies um, and, and pick their brains a little bit on what they, what they do and where you want to go. So um, be sure to take advantage of that. And then last thing is on your tables, um, there's a little QR code. If we could have all the students, um, not, not right now or maybe at the end or whatever, just take out your phones and scan it. That's going to register you for Weba for the club. So when we have monthly events, then you will get those emails and those updates and be invited to them. Because She's Daring Mighty Things is so great and we love it, but we want you to continue. We want to create that community. So continue with us by signing up for our club. Um, I think that's all the business before I introduce Lindsay. So... Lindsay Ballenquist is an assistant vice president at Intermountain Healthcare, an integrated delivery network based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Her current portfolio includes responsibility for business relationship management functions, which serves to bridge the gap between the company's technology division and clinical business leaders. Lindsay has worked in healthcare for the past 15 years in role spanning both payer and provider. At Intermountain Healthcare, Lindsay has had experience working in several, several venues, including payer contracting, revenue integrity, EMR implementation, and revenue cycle options. Lindsay serves as board member for the Utah chapter of the Healthcare Financial Management Association and a steering committee member for the Business Women's Forum and with a Salt Lake chapter chamber. So we are so grateful that she came. Um, and we're grateful that she is willing to share her thoughts on this Friday morning. So please welcome Lindsay. I think I, I got it. I forgot that you had it. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. All right. 
Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is a topic that I'm really passionate about and I think this is so cool that you guys have this type of a forum here at Utah State. Uh, we didn't have things like this when I went to school <laughs> and I think as a woman um, in a professional sense like this, this is so needed as you prepare to enter into the workforce. So I'm going to spend a few minutes today talking about finding your true north and I'll tell you the, the impetus for this presentation really came um, because about say 10 years ago, I created a true north out of necessity. It wasn't something that was for my professional life. It was really something that was out of survival because of where I was in my, in my life and the situation that I was in. And as I started to like move throughout my career, I found that that true north served me really well for like about 10 years. And then I got kind of stuck. I got into this place where things weren't as easy. I didn't know which roles I wanted to go for. I didn't know, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Like everything just got harder and I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out why I was stuck. And then it occurred to me one day as I was, you know, I like to, to read a lot of um, business books, but this is based off of a book called Finding Your True North uh, by Bill George with the Harvard Business School. Um, I realized my true north was outdated. I, the, the directional statement I had created for myself 10 years didn't serve me anymore. So as you guys are going through this presentation with me, think about the fact that you're going to need to revisit this. Like you're going to start off with something today and where you are in your life, where you are with school, where you are in your career, it's going to be, need to be something that's really visceral to you in this moment. But it may not be the thing that's visceral to you in 10 years. So that's where this sort of uh, came about. So let's see if I can, I've told people I'm clicker challenged. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm going to start off by introducing myself and I'm going to do the story kind of backwards. I'm going to end with a happy ending, and then I'll tell you about the not happy beginning so that you guys can see where I've come from. So uh, I've been with Intermountain Healthcare for 14 years, and I have climbed what I would like to call not a career ladder. It's been a career lattice. I've never had a position that was in the same job family. Uh, when I started, I was in my undergraduate program. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in finance. And um, I was an, a coordinator in the heart transplant program, which was really not where I thought I would find myself as a finance undergraduate. <laughs> um, but we do a lot with our, our transplant population. Um, from there, I went to uh, payer contracting when I finished my undergraduate degree um, as an analyst. I then went into regional management over a few of our hospitals in the Salt Lake Valley as a manager then as a director in the strategy department of the revenue cycle, so see none of these really go with each other. Um, and then found myself as a partner in the IT organization, then was promoted three years ago as an assistant vice president. And I just got promoted again to a different role that's not been announced yet, but I'll let you guys know. Um, <laughs> since I don't think there's anyone from my team, but I'll be leading all of our integration efforts with our mergers and acquisitions that we've been doing, which we just had one announced. So it's really been a exciting career tra trajectory for me. And I feel really fortunate to have been able to spend so much time with one employer. Um, that's not the norm, I feel like, these days anymore. Most people are kind of bouncing around. But for me, I've, been, I've had many careers in one organization just by thinking a little bit more dynamic about my skill set. Um, I'm fortunate to be married to my best friend, my husband Rob. That's at our wedding. That's probably my favorite picture at our wedding because he thought he was going to smash a piece of cake in my face and it wasn't going to happen. So, <laughs> But he thought and it was just so funny the photographer caught it. But that really encapsulates our relationship. We just like to have fun. Um, I have two children that are grown. Uh, my daughter, this is at her high school graduation from Olympus High School. She's 22 now, my son is 20. Um, and it's, uh, it's funny, we just moved him out again for the second time. So maybe, you know, in your age range that relates to you. But we moved him out once, that didn't work, moved home, moved him out again. So we're in that kind of funny, empty nester part of our lives. Um, and this is our, uh, our most recent addition to the family. We decided it would be fun to take on a pandemic puppy. Uh, we'd never had a dog before, but this is Lucia. She's our Irish setter, so 
Um, she's, she was really irritated that I didn't walk her this morning <laughs> since I was cruising up here. But um, this is my life today, and it seems like it's probably really idyllic, right? I'm successful in my career. My family is happy. Um, we are able to do all the things that we want to do in life, and, and everything is in the, in the most positive trajectory it could be. And none of that would have been possible had I not come up with a really really good True North statement 10 years ago, I would be in a very different place. So let's jump into what is a True North. This is the definition that is in the books, um, so Bill George's definition. Um, but really, it's your, guiding, it's your guiding light in the world when it's dark. It is when there's a lot of craziness, when there's a lot of variables happening to you, it's the thing you can go back to again and again to say, what should I do? Where should I go? What is the right thing to do in this situation? Um, and it's really personal to each person. My true north is not going to speak to probably anybody in this room, and your true north won't speak to anybody else. Um, so it's something that you've got to do a lot of work uh, to figure out. I and mean, when I came up with my first one, I don't know that I had I mean, there, this book obviously wasn't published. Um, I wish I would have had something that let me do it in a more thoughtful way. Um, but uh, it's, like I said, it's it served me really well throughout my life. So today, we're going to do three different activities um, to help you develop your true north. And like I said, there's going to be some more work you'll need to do outside of this meeting. And I hope you take the opportunity to read the book um, so that you can dive in a little bit deeper. But we're going to start with introspection, which is examining your life story. Uh, we're then going to take that life story and isolate some of those experiences into something you're going to hear called crucibles, uh, which are kind of defining moments in your life. Um, and then we're going to go into finding your sweet spot. So that's where we leverage your strengths and your motivations to their best combination. That's the sweet spot. So we'll get to that uh, at the end as well. Okay. So we'll start with my, the beginning of my story. So these are my kids. This is when they were little. Um, and if any of you kind of did some of that uh, math about how old they are, you'd be very kind to say you don't look old enough to have a 22-year-old. And really, I'm not. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a community called Glendale, which is in, it's close to downtown Salt Lake City. It uh, has a claim to fame right now that's not great. It has one of the highest COVID infection rates because of a lot of socioeconomic factors. Um, if you're ever interested in learning a little bit about healthcare and how it affects communities, there's a lot of uh, work and research being done on social determinants of health. And that would, if you're ever interested in that, would explain why the infection rates in, in that community are so high. Um, but it's, by and large, everyone that lives there lives below the poverty limit. Um, usually you got a lot of people in one little tiny house. Uh, I had five brothers and sisters, and um, it was uh, a part of town that has a fairly high crime rate, gangs, all the things you'd expect from an inner city neighborhood, which I know everyone thinks Utah doesn't have inner cities, but <laughs> it's as inner as we could muster in the state of Utah. Um, <laughs> So I was always known for being really bright. Um, all through school, I never studied. I never had to really work hard at school. It really irritated my older sister because she would study really hard. And I'd go take the same tests and you know, get an A and just really bugged her. <laughs> um, I was always known as somebody that was going to be somebody when I left Glen Like w one day when, you know, because you all want to get out of Glendale. So one day when I grew up, everybody thought I would be the one that would be successful. So when I hit junior high and high school, you'll find that it's not cool to be smart. It's not cool to be the one that raises your hand all the time. Not cool to be that kid that's like one up and everybody, right? So I had to take a little bit of a detour from myself, from the things that were the values that I held really dear as a younger child. Um, and I started doing things that were probably not in line with my values. So I found myself at 16 pregnant uh, with my daughter Jada. I had her at 17. I thought then it would be a really great idea to get married at 17. Wasn't a good idea. <laughs> uh, I had a, my son at 20, and then I had a divorce by 22. So I'd lived a lot of life before I was like barely legal enough to like have a drink, right? So it was. It was not what I had expected. 
my life to do. And I think everybody thought, like a lot of girls in Glendale, that we just forget about Lindsay. You know, she, she, she followed that path and that's kind of what happens and she's gonna become a statistic. But I remember sitting in my dining room one day and I was thinking it can't be this way. Like it can't end this way. Like this is not, I don't wanna perpetuate this cycle of my mom was a teen mom, I'm a teen mom. I'm not gonna push that on to my children. So I came up with my first year north. This is not inspirational to any of you. <laughs> um, make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible, so they never feel it. It was so important to me that they not know. Like, you know, they're little kids. They don't really get this whole thing about like, well, how, well, how old I am, like none of that. Like they didn't understand any of that. So. But I knew that, and it was really important to me that we not, that that cycle not perpetuate itself, that they never felt that stigma and shame of being the product of a teen mom. So everything that I did from that point on was around that true north. I knew that in order for me to make more money and to be able to apply for more jobs, I had to go to college. So I was like, what degree do I get? Okay, well my true north tells me I need to make as much money as possible, as quickly as possible. So I went to the community college and I said, what degree can I finish the fastest that allows me to apply for as many jobs as I can? And they're like, a uh, business degree? Like that feels general, right? So I did a business degree for my undergraduate and I discovered I don't like HR classes, so I switched to finance. <laughs> um, later on, as I got my first job at Intermountain and started to move up, um, I found that I finished my undergraduate degree and if I wanted to make more money, I had to leave a job that I loved to make more money because that was my true north. So I left the job that my first job that I loved, I went into uh, payer contracting. Um, but I wouldn't have done that if I didn't, my true north didn't compel me to do that. I wouldn't have taken those types of risks. Um, and the same thing when I went into being a manager, when I went into being a director, I finished my MBA and those HR classes came back and found me. Um, <laughs> and every decision I made was for this. And that's when I got stuck because when my kids were grown and we didn't really worry about money anymore, I lost kind of, I kind of lost my mojo. I was like, I don't know what to do now. Like, what am I, like, I have nothing driving me, nothing helping me, nothing guiding me. And that's where we are today is this is kind of the, the culmination of all of that. So a couple of definitions and we'll go into our first activity. A crucible moment um, is something that they talk a lot about in the book. You obviously can tell what my crucible moment was. <laughs> um, and there were several that were in that time span. Um, but it's a transformative experience where you come out with an altered sense of your identity. Right, when I went into that, I thought I like felt a lot of shame. I felt like a failure. I felt like I did all the things I wasn't supposed to do because I let my values relax. And when I came out of it, when I started to like really hone my strength and own my true north, I was an altered person, but it was because of my crucible that I was, uh, I was in that situation. So now I want you to take a look inside your books and you're going to see the first activity. There's a couple of boxes. The first one is about your life story um, and your crucibles. So in box one, you want to identify your values um, and principles. What are some of the things in your life that you really want to live by? Um, and for me, that's a little bit with this one. So these are some of my values over on the right hand or on the left hand side um, and, and where that crucible impacted it. So my parents, my mom always called me an egghead. She said that meant I was smart. Um, but, and to me, that was important growing up. Like that was part of my identity was being the smart kid. And I really relaxed that so that I could fit in with the other kids, the, the schools that I went to. And when I relaxed that value, it really led to my crucible. Um, another value that I have is I feel like I'm really self-reliant. I was self-reliant before the crucible, but that crucible really like created and honed that in for me. I also think that I'm really resilient. Um, it strengthened that for me. Um, and then I'm also really quick on my feet. And, and I'll tell you one story quickly about that. So when my kids were growing up and we were in our, one of our first houses, 
Um, you know, in Utah, it's hot in the summer, it's really cold in the winter. And every year, you know, in the summer, your gas bill's like nothing. In the winter, it's like three or $400. And as a single mom, I couldn't afford that. So inevitably, every summer, my gas would get shut off because, you know, in the, they can't shut it off in the wintertime, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, so I was like, oh, what am I going to do? It's going to take me all summer to pay this off. I went and bought the biggest stock pot I could find because I had an electric stove. And I would fill that thing up with like three really boiling, like, uh, jugs of water, put that in the tub, add cold water, and then my kids never knew that the gas wasn't on because like, they could have a hot bath, and I just got used to taking cold showers. But that's an example of my being resourceful. That's a value. That's something that I think is really important, and you know, that's a terrible way to learn that you're resourceful, but it's something that served me, continued to serve me well in my career. So let's take like eight minutes, and let's go through and kind of write that down. Um, and I know you've got mentors at your tables as well. So if you've got, if you're stuck and you need ideas, maybe talk through that. But we'll we'll break for about eight minutes. <laughs> All right. We're going to go on to our next. Uh, part of your worksheet. So I'm going to give you a few more definitions to think about and then we'll go back into your groups. I love that there was a lot of sharing and discussion that was happening at the end of that time. So the next thing we're going to talk about are your motivations. Um, those align closely with your cultural norms. Um, they're going to be intrinsic and extrinsic, but they shouldn't in general come from both places. Like if my true north statement would have said, make as much money as possible, I might have had a different outcome. <laughs> I might have hit a burnout wall a little bit sooner, right? Um, but because it was balanced with that so they don't feel it, that more intrinsic feeling, that intrinsic motivation, it was a little bit more, uh, little bit more balanced. Um, so those are your motivations, so why you're doing the things that you're doing. So here's some examples of uh, motivators, like another one that in my line of work, um, I've typically done more strategic functions, um, so influencing others. It's funny, when I went from being in a operational leadership role into a more consultative strategic role, I didn't realize how much more I would like being the influencer as opposed to the actual decision maker. And it was really interesting throughout my career as I've kind of found these things like, Ooh, that's motivating. So now I actually look for jobs that are more about influencing instead of being the decision maker. Um, so that, those are some examples. Um, the extrinsic, a little bit easier to identify. Um, do you want that prestigious title? Do you want social status? Do you want people to know that you're an authority? Um, and those are not bad, just, just so you know. Like, it's good to have them come out of both sides. Your strengths um, are coming from a place of if you think about all the things you've done in your life and as you kind of move forward with your career, like I just kind of explained, you start to find the things that you're actually good at. And your sweet spot really comes when you can leverage your strengths in such a way that you're feeding your motivations. So if you can find a job, say that one of your motivators is that you want to make more money, um, and you can find a job making a lot of money influencing others, then you found a place where you can have that sweet spot. Um, and leaders typically are, you know, you're acting in your like truest sense of you as a leader when you can find that sweet spot. So look for some of the unique strengths that you bring that nobody else does. Um, so here's a couple that, that I've identified with myself through the years. So I'm pretty good at identifying what's actually going on in a situation. I've taken many teams where I come in and they're like, oh, they're a train wreck. Like, and they're a train wreck because of this, this, and this. And if I just get in and observe for a little bit, kind of start to see the inner dynamics, I can typically pretty quick figure out what's actually going on and why they're actually not functioning well as a team. So I seek those opportunities out. Um, I see possibilities where others see none. Um, so you see kind of a theme. I like to go find really sticky, ugly situations and then help get them out of the sticky, ugly situation. Um, I make things happen rather than talking about them. I am an executor. If I know something needs to get done, it's going to get done. Uh, whatever the outcome needs to be, it's going to be that. But I think that comes from a lot of my values. I'm very, you know, I'm very self-reliant. I'm very accountable, um, very outcomes-driven. 
Um, and then able to facilitate and problem solve with difficult teams. These are all things as a leader that I bring to the table that I know is a strength that separates me from some of my, uh, some of my counterparts. So now we're gonna take a few more moments, so eight minutes, um, and let's talk about finding your sweet spot. So in your groups, you see that you've got your two little bubbles, um, one for your strengths and one for your motivators. Um, and then there's a few questions at the bottom that will help you with discussion. So look at, at those. These are geared towards leadership role, but in anything that you're doing in your life, kind of think about what are ways that you could be leveraging yourself in that sweet spot a little bit more. So let's take another eight minutes. Does anyone want to share? I think you have to come up here if you want to share, though, because there's a camera out there. Yeah? I can't bring it. I don't know how to. There we go. Who had their hand up? You want to share? Be brave. <laughs> oh, there's one. Thanks. And if you want to say your name, stand up, and your major. Um, I'm Sarah, and my major is econ. And I just really liked how you talked about it's OK, and it's a good thing to be intrinsically and extrinsically motivated. Because mm -hmm. I feel like growing up, I've always kind of been taught to like intrinsically, like the desire to succeed should just come from within. But I like the feeling of doing something good and then getting praise from it. I yeah. feel like that's a good motivator. And I liked how you highlighted that it's OK to be extrinsically motiv as motivated as well as intrinsically motivated. Mm -hmm. And the balance of both is what helps us really become successful. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, you don't want to be all the way intrinsically motivated either, you know, because you need that balance. Is there another one? Anyone want to share where their sweet spot is? Hi, I'm Carter. I'm uh, majoring in business management. And uh, my end goal is to own my own business. And so um, what I've been learning so far and just the few classes that I'm taking this semester have already um, propelled me from my previous knowledge. And so like coming from like Neither my parents went to college and kind of like the, they want me to go to college, but if you're going to own your own business, you don't really have to. But it's already, like, I mean, I'm a freshman. This is my first semester, and I'm three weeks into my first classes, and I've already learned so much about how business works, and that's going to just propel me so far. So, yeah. Excellent. We need more women business owners, so good job with that. Anybody else? Okay, my name is Mackenzie Meekum. I'm an accounting major, and I kind of just have a sweet spot experience I guess I could share. So I was in a leadership class last semester, and we were assigned to do a leadership program project, and I decided to do uh, like a make-a-wish experience for the skills developmental lab here on campus at USU. So it's basically, the Skills Developmental Lab is just basically for adults with disabilities. It's a place for them to like, just to go and continue to learn. So for my project, I did this Make-A-Wish project. And I feel like it was just really was my sweet spot because I'm really like a self-motivated individual and really organized. And for that project, I had to stay organized just to keep track of like all of the wishes, but also just like, I've always like had a lot of love in my heart, that makes sense. Like I just love a lot of people and feel like I always have a lot of love to give. So that was just like an awesome opportunity to have a sweet spot, I guess, and have an experience with my sweet spot. That's perfect. Yeah, so you, one of your strengths is being organized and you got to leverage that to feed one of your motivations of helping others. And those are the types of examples that you really want to see, how do I keep having those types of experiences. And if you could get paid to do those types of experiences, so much the better. Um, that's exactly what it is to find your, your sweet spot. So to bring this all together, um, like I said earlier, your sweet spot really is bringing your motivations and your strengths together to leverage them. And, and just one more example I might give you is where it didn't work out for me is when I went from my job in transplant as a, as a coordinator, into payer contracting as an analyst. That's the first job where I was ever sought out. They didn't have a good, strong connection to the clinical side of, 
of Intermountain Healthcare. So they wanted to, I don't know if I was like a mole for them, like to connect so that they could get some of the information they needed about transplant contracts. But as I got there, I realized it's very detail oriented work. It's very like, there's not a lot of like learning high level strategy. You're just in your cubicle all day going through contracts and making sure this comma is where it's supposed to be, that this word is, is in the right place, that we have the terms correct, that we got the right negotiation points in there. And I realized probably a year into it, like, I hate this type of work. Like, this is not my strengths. This is not my motivations. Like, I made more money, but my, all the things that I valued, and when I say your values, I'm not necessarily talking about, like, morals, but, like, the things I value in the work that I do, it didn't, it didn't align with any of them. And so I had a really transparent conversation with my leader and I'm like, look, this isn't the right fit for me. And he probably knew too. He was probably like, yeah, duh, lady. <laughs> like, um, but it was one of those things where I said, I will do the best job for you I can until I find something that aligns more with my skills. And he really appreciated me being upfront and open about that. And I did, I tried really hard, but that actually led me to my next job because the compliance department was right next door. My leader talked to their leader and said, hey, Lindsay would do really great in this type of a role. I interviewed for that role, didn't get it because another person was kind of lined up for it, but I ended up taking that person's job. But it was like one of those things where I was really just open and transparent about something that wasn't aligned to my values, didn't speak to my, you know, all of my true north statements and all of my principles that I had for myself and I went and connected out there and found something better that did and that that's something I would encourage you to do too anytime you have an experience you were like oh I really don't like this think about why you really don't like it think about what it's not speaking to in you and why why maybe that's not something you want to do in the future how do I avoid that type of thing in the future and do something that I would like that's something as you're in your early years of your career I would really encourage you to take those experiences. What did you really love about this? What did you really not like about this? And find a way to get into that sweet spot. So, we're coming to a, uh, the end of this. Um, some additional reading. These are the two books that go along with this presentation. So, Discover Your True North by Bill George. He also writes a lot about it. It's If you go out and Google um, he's written a ton of articles, not just for the Harvard Business Review, but just for a lot of different um, outlets. And then the Discover Your True North field book is really cool. You know, and if I had to say one or the other, I would almost listen to the audio book of the Discover Your True North and do the field book as the companion because there's so many activities in there that really help you do that deep work that you need to do to, to find where you need to go. And then again, revisit it, come back to it. After you've had a few years and you know, you're out of school and you're in your first career, come back and look at it. Are these the same things that are important to me? Are these the same things that matter? Am I interpreting my crucibles in the right way? Because you grow so much as a person in your early 20s. And you know, as I'm about to hit 40 in December, um, I feel like I'm entering this whole new part of my life where you know this revamp true north had to happen for me because it's just a whole new world and we just keep growing. But I just want to thank you all for your time today and look forward to connecting. If you are on LinkedIn, um, come find me. I'm happy to chat with anybody um, if you're looking for advice or mentoring. I love to do that. So just thank you so much for having me today. on the stage and maybe in between we can do a, a raffle drawing would that be okay Olivia yeah. as Paul and Holly are making their way up here um, so we it's not really a well it is kind of a raffle but just of those those of you that have pre-registered we are so grateful um, so that we could count the numbers and figure out spots for everyone so we picked some of you from the list um, just randomly and we have some shirts here um, and we also have true north books here um, and so if you need a different size then just come by the dean's office and we get you a different size of that t-shirt um, but real quick can we have a little drum roll for a raffle okay <laughs> 
The first one is Annalyn Wengreen. Is Annalyn here? Okay, and you can choose a shirt or a book. Yeah, the shirts are cute. <laughs> Just kidding. This looks cool too. Okay, um, and then we'll do one more. Drum roll, please. And Anna Davidson. Is she here? Oh, she's my buddy. Hi, Anna. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you, Olivia. Is there another um, mic that we can use for both Holly and Paul? They'll <laughs> share those. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for those amazing words and for that inspiration. We're going to kind of continue in a little more of an informal way so that if you have questions, you can ask um, our wonderful panel. And um, we know who Lindsay is. We've got an introduction for her. But I'm wondering if any of you remember her Irish setter's dog's name. Anyone was listening? I think I heard it. Yeah, Lucia. Yes, yes OK. Um, next to um, Lindsay, we have Holly Robb Galbraith. And um, she is our, the director at, of the Government Relations and Licensing at Maverick. Um, she has worked at Maverick for nine years. And she is all things um, to make sure things are on brand for all the stores and make sure that um, the 360 stores in 11 Western states are represented. So she's got a, a big job. So, so glad that you can be with us. Something that is not on, online about Holly is that she loves all things sports. Is that right? Including golf and? Golf, basketball, football, not soccer. I'm sorry. I just don't understand. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much. And then next to me, many of you might recognize him because he is faculty here. He's a senior lecturer at the Huntsman School of Business, Paul Felstead, who has um, been a, an ally and mentor for many, many students. In fact, he's one of our scholar um, program mentors, and so he can um, help um, a lot of students to, to find their true north, if you will. He has three children, and I just learned that all his family are Aggies, so they're all, um, yeah, from this wonderful institution. Um, and he indicated that he has two outdoor cats. <laughs> so you'll have to follow up with him later about what that means in terms of outdoor. But he does live in Wellsville, so maybe there's something to that. OK. Well, thank you for joining us in, in this panel discussion. I wanted to sort of start off with a question um, for all three of you. Um, that relates to our motto here at the Huntsman School about to dare mighty things. When we talk about finding our true north and then also thinking about um, how we can kind of get ourselves there, we have to get out of our comfort zone. So I'm wondering if each of you would share with us something that you found yourself in in terms of a moment of dare mighty. And whether you succeeded or failed, uh, maybe you'll share one of each or just one of, the, one of those. And we'll start with you first, Paul. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I, um, I'm not the type of person, I'm actually quite risk averse, and I don't like, you know, I, I actually don't like putting myself out there a lot. Um, but when I was at Utah State, um, I had some professors who were, I was, I was a liberal arts major here, and um, in the, we had some English, some English and um, poli sci professors who really encouraged me to apply for a Rhodes Scholar, which oh. I was, I was thought, well, that'd be cool, but I don't think I'll get it, right? And and I didn't, okay? Like I tried, <laughs> and they were really good. Like they spent tons of time with me and everything, and I really feel like I kind of let them down in a lot of ways. But um, you know, I was grateful that. Um, I mean, I I guess what what I learned from that is. Um, it's okay to fail, first of all. Like, it was a great experience for me. I learned a ton from it. Um, and I think I came away with just a ton of gratitude to those professors, right, who helped me so much. And even though I was, I was not successful, at least in that sense, um, it inspired me a lot to, to try to do that for other people. So in, in that way, it was actually a big turning point for me and a way to think about helping other people. Okay, wonderful. Holly? 
Um, so I, I thought a lot about this question. Um, and it was really, really interesting for me to see where my mind went. Immediately, my mind went to all of my failures, you know, and how could I get better? And I, and I had to mentally stop and think, okay, that's great. Everybody fails. You learn from it. But what did you succeed in? And being here and doing my, the job that I do probably is the biggest thing that has um, affected me and changed me. And, and, and I dared to be mighty. I came down to this earth shy, introvert, pain, painfully shy. I would hide behind people. Um, clear up until pretty much college, I stayed in the background. And in college, I kind of broke out of my shell. Um, and then I found myself a single mom of a, of a beautiful daughter who was two years old. And I needed to take care of this child. And I needed to be an example to her. And I had to decide what I wanted to do. Where is my true north, right? And I love, I love government relations. As funny as that is, as, as shy as I am, I like people, right? Um, I just don't like to talk to them. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's hard for me to do that. So I, I decided that I needed to go into government relations. And, and my previous um, work experience was in that field. And so I started, I branched out. I started to belong to organizations. I started to um, take classes about how I could project myself and be a better speaker. And then I practiced. I practiced a lot. I talked to myself in the mirror. I talked to my daughters. I talked to my cats. You know, whatever <laughs> it took so I could get confidence to be in front of people so I think that I'm sounding articulate and getting my point across because that's part of my job is negotiations and telling people how wonderful um, Maverick is and, and how persuasive we need to be to do these things. And to be quite honest with you, being here with you is a goal. Because I, um, I would never see myself doing this in front of 200 people. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's I would see. say the most recent daring thing I did was applying for the job that I just got. Uh, growth um, is a big strategy for the mountain. We're going into a world where we want to have more value-based care, so where you know providers are not reimbursed for uh, the quantity of services they provide, but rather like how well do you keep your patients? And so it's it's a role. I had applied for a role a couple of years ago with the leader that's over this particular area, and you know we just really hit it off in that interview. They happen to be same. Th it happens every time. Honestly, they're promoting someone from within, which I think is great. But I made such an impression on him. When this position came up, he asked me to apply for it, and I was like, "Oh, that's terrifying! Like, I've, you know, if I, if I fail, I will fail in front of the biggest leaders of my company, and I will really, you know, foobar a big strategy that we have, right? Like, it's a very big stage to fail on." Um, but I, I decided, you know, that's the next step. That's like the scariest thing that I could do in my career right now. It's like and it scares me, so I should do it because it terrifies me. Um, but and then I got it, and you know now I'm. Then they announced a, a new merger the next day, <laughs> like the biggest one that we've ever done. So, um, but yeah, that's probably the thing that I. That's the biggest dare that I've done recently. But you know, I now that I'm in it, I'm like, let's do it. You know, like I feel like everything else I've done, I've been able to like muster all my courage, and it's come out okay. So it's, but it's it's scary. But I think you should do things that scare you. Oh, what a wonderful like <laughs> mantra! Do things that scare you. Yeah. That's awesome. And Holly, I really appreciate that you said this is a, a trait that terrifies me, but I'm going to force myself because this is the work I want to do. And Paul, your message of sort of saying, I want to give back because I had this great experience in your early years. I mean, it defines who we are, right? These mighty moments. Um, I think I'm going to see if Olivia has any audience members who has a question. We have some more questions here, but we want to gather some from our participants. Yes, any students that have thought of some questions would like to ask the panel here, do you want to raise your hand? 
perfect. Okay, and I just got a message from the other room that when we speak into the microphones, we need to speak loud so that it can um, be zoomed over correctly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My name is Catherine. My major is civil engineering. Um, I absolutely love being here, and thank you, Lindsay, for your amazing, um, amazing <laughs> presentation, just barely. And I know you kind of already asked this, so maybe this is a little bit more directed at Paul and Holly, but, um, and I know we just learned about this True North thing today, but do you feel like that your True Norths have changed over the course of your career, over the course of your lives? <laughs> <laughs> For two, okay. So, <laughs> both um, so for me, definitely, uh, I could really relate to Lindsay's when when you mentioned um, making money, right? Um, that was a big motivator for me coming out of college, and it was probably about being like independent and being like secure. Um, it was kind of the value it was attached to. That's clearly, you know, that was a big goal, um, and. Now um, it's it's changed a bit. Like um, like that kind of part of things is, is sort of settled to some degree, right? And so it becomes kind of less of a like front of mind problem. Uh, but now it's much more like you know when you have kids, right? You worry about your kids, right? And <laughs> what choices they're making. Um, and in this in my role here, it's more about okay, what are students doing and. Um, you know how how are they um, prepared? What am I doing to help them? You know, be successful and be confident. So it totally changed for me. Like now, it's more about um, like it, it's hard because you kind of define your success on what other people do, right? Their their choices. But hopefully, you help them make choices that allow them to, to succeed and be confident. And that's that's more the challenge. For My true north has absolutely changed. Um, for a long time, probably 20 years, I changed jobs every five years. I don't know what it was, but they were always better. I was moving up. And, I, and looking back, I find myself wanting to learn more. Um, so I think when I get stagnant in a job or something, I, I refocus. And I, I want more goals. I need to make more goals and more um, become l learned in a different area. And so, yeah, I think every five years I have reassessed, um, except for Maverick. I've been here now f 10 years, actually. This will be my 10th year. And I think that is because in the position I am, Every day changes. I'm working with legislators, city council, community councils on issues that are never the same. So I'm always challenged. And I think that is really important in your career to make sure that you are learning and you are challenging yourself almost daily. I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists a, a question that I, I provided earlier, but I'm going to feed off of this True North idea on how um, you know, as students, they come to my office and they're, they're sometimes petrified about, you know, a course they're taking or maybe a chance they'll take or an internship that they'll, they hope to get. And, and at those junctions, you know, there are moments where we want to inspire confidence and to help them find their true north, right? And so many students who come through my door do sort of um, intimate that they feel like they're an imposter, that they are, you know, not good enough for that internship that maybe they landed, or they're not good enough for, you know, the Huntsman program or for the classes that they're taking. And so they feel like there's this gap. And, you know, you've probably noticed that Paul is here to help represent sort of our allyship with a lot of our um, male faculty here at the Huntsman School. And so I'm going to ask him first, like, what are some strategies that you do to help those uh, female students who come to your door and sort of say, what do I do, you know, Professor Felstead, what do I, you know, how do I negotiate and, and kind of move forward? Um, so um, maybe I'll try to answer this with just a quick experience. Sure. So I met my wife here at Utah State. We, we got married, we both graduated, got married, moved to New York like two weeks later. And we were both started 
jobs there. And um, when, after a couple of months, we were like on a weekend, we're talking and, you know, I think my wife said, you know, I can't believe that they haven't discovered that I'm totally incompetent yet. You know, like <laughs> at some point they're going to just go, hold it. Like you have no idea what you're doing. Right. <laughs> and they, they can't believe we hired you. you know? <laughs> and I felt the same way in my job. Like I, I was convinced that any day now, like my boss was going to pull me aside and say, we're going to have to let you go because, you know, we thought you were good, but actually you're, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> right. Um, so I think that it's very common. Like this is a very common thing. And um, like I feel that some way in like teaching, okay, sometimes like even now, like um, there are times when I'm like, wow, I, what am I doing here really, right? Like um, so I, I don't think that that's, um, that's, that's not certainly not a male-female thing. I, I think it's very common. Mm. Um, and um, I think it's important to recognize that everyone feels that way, I think to some degree or another. Um, People are good at covering it up, I think. Um, and maybe there truly are people out there who totally do believe that they're competent all the time with everything they do. <laughs> but I'm certainly not there. I don't know anybody right, that I know wet really well who would honestly say that there are times when they feel the same way. <laughs> okay, So um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that there's an answer to that, but I think at least um, you, know, it, it's like you can own that it's okay to feel that way. And maybe that helps you kind of take the next step into trying something scary because yeah everyone feels scared <laughs> right at times and it's okay to be scared i think that's nothing wrong with that that's great holly do you want to share all, experience or something sure, really quick have you all heard the term fake it till you make it <laughs> yeah that's what i think this is and i totally agree everybody feels this way and and you do you fake it until you make it but how is it that you make it right that's the key um, if you don't know something, find out, ask somebody, learn, get a book, Google it. You know, I, um, before my job at uh, Maverick, I worked at Rio Tinto, Kennecott Copper, the big pit out, out west. And my new boss asked me to um, answer a bunch of questions about minerals. I don't know anything about minerals, so I had to look it all up. And it was exactly what she wanted. But if you don't know something, take it and circle it in mm -hmm. every single area that you can find. Find everything about it that you can and learn. That's great. Lindsay? So I would say two things. So the fake it till you make it is I always refer to it as smoke and mirrors. There's a period of time in, in all of my roles where I have to be a little bit about the smoke and mirrors. Like I have to, everyone has to think that I know what I'm doing and think that I understand it. But really I've just gotten very good at like dancing around it in a way that people think that I know what I'm doing. And so it's funny cause I've had, I've had uh, leaders that report to me say, how did you go into that meeting? I haven't even briefed you. I'm like, it's a smoke and mirrors, man. Like they don't need to know that. And so, know that that exists like everywhere a lot of people that you think are being confident really are just good at that skill um, the other thing that i would say is whatever you've built up in your head is what is you're supposed to be in this role whatever the um the ideal student you know at the huntsman school of business or whoever is supposed to be doing that job why why like why can't you redefine what that should be and what sh success should look like in that role i would say with most roles i've taken at Inner mountain i have morphed them into what works for what my vision is of that job or my vision of what success is you know it's guided by obviously my leaders but I don't ever think that I need to go in there and emulate whoever was there before me or whoever's going to come after me. And I tell that to my successors too. It doesn't need to be the way that I did it. Um, but I think that you've got to get it out of your head that there's some preconceived notion of what that is supposed to be. Define that for yourself and then you really own that job. You'll own that position. Like that's what I would say. Oh, great. Yeah. I think you've just heard some excellent advice, hopefully some note-taking that's been happening because um, these are such great words of wisdom. Do we want to throw it back to an audience question to see if someone has um, something they want to ask the panel? Yes. Questions, anyone? Leanne's got one. Oh, OK. 
got Carter, looks like, in the back, too. Hi, um, so I know Lindsay, I don't know, tell, like stand that? Stand up. Oh, stand up, okay. Hi, I'm Carter, I already talked, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, I talk a lot. Um, Lindsay, I know you talked about how you were already in your position when you started working on your MBA, um, and I'm trying to figure out how to do work in school at the same time right now. Do you have any advice on how to manage the, the balance between, you know, working and going to school? Mm -hmm. That's hard and so for me I did it I did it with two little kids too so that was even more hard um I had to really prioritize my life at that point in time the two most important things for me were school making sure that the kids you know were mostly taken care of <laughs> and then and that at work I didn't it's hard to say it's hard to say this, but that I wasn't in, a, in anything that was overly demanding. Like it wasn't the right time for me to go and say, I'm gonna like break through the glass ceiling and take on this big leadership role, right? It wasn't the right time. So I really timed when I was really engaged with school versus when I had like parts in my career where I felt like I was having a little bit of like, I know this job, I can, it's kind of on autopilot. Now I'm gonna really double down on school. Um, and, and you guys are, you know, obviously doing it in the more traditional sense. Like I was in school at night and I would, you know, my kids would go to bed. I would make sure they did their homework. And then I was studying from the time they went to bed at eight o'clock until one o'clock in the morning. And it was just about me prioritizing what was the most important to me at that point in time. I had to work to survive, but that wasn't the most important thing. I wanted to get through school and I wanted my kids to not feel the, sting the fact that I was hardly, you know, that there were a lot of times I wasn't there. So I think it's all about prioritizing and then making sure that those things you're prioritizing just get a little more time and that you allow yourself to say this other thing that's not as important that I'm going to focus on it, but it's not going to be something that I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, 120% at. And I think that's how people burn out when they think that I need to go 200% at everything I'm doing all the time, like that's just not realistic. So you've just got to take and say, for this period of time, this is going to come up a little bit and I'm going to bring this down in priority and just kind of balance it out. That's what I, it was a lot of priority. I didn't see a lot of my friends. I, I think they think I just disappeared for like 10 years. Um, but it was, it was a very intentional prioritization. Holly or Paul, do you guys want to add or give some advice on that? You know, I think Lindsay's spot on. Um, I think we are all really good at multitasking, and and we do have to prioritize the 80-20 concept, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I, too, went to, I did graduate work while I was married and, and working. Um, I'm sorry, it was at Westminster. Don't. <laughs> but it was where it was located at the time. Uh, but I, I did not have kids. My, I have a daughter, at, and I did not have her at the time. So I was able to go to night school. Um, and it was tough. It is, it's hard. It's really hard. But what's your goal? You know, what do you want to achieve in the end? And that's what I think you have to focus and sacrifice for. Great. I think what I'll do is I'll ask each of you maybe s some advice that you might give to your 20-something selves. If you could, look, you know, time travel back and sort of let yourself know, like, what is some advice that, that you would give yourself that might resonate with our audience here? Is there some bits of wisdom? I would say, and this is something I've told my 20-year-old sister and my 20-year-old children, <laughs> is you're not supposed to have it all figured out at 20 because you don't even know yourself yet. You think you know yourself at 20, you're gonna change so much between now and 30. And so allow yourself the flexibility to feel into the person that you're gonna become because it will, it will be infinitely different than the person that you are right now. That's great. I have a couple of thoughts on this. Um, the first is have more fun. I know that sounds weird at 20, but <laughs> I was focused so much on getting through school and doing the right things that I don't think I enjoyed college as much as I could have. And 
that's part of life. Have, have fun all the way through life. The other is, actually I've got two more. You can have the big job. It's this imposter thing, right? You absolutely can go for that job. You deserve it. They need you to be there to do, to do it. And the last thing I would tell myself is to stop saying I'm sorry a lot. I think as, as women, we go in and we say, oh, I'm so sorry I'm late, instead of thank you so much for waiting for me, right? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that question, instead of can you please repeat that so I understand? You know, you have nothing to be sorry for. You're here, you're great, your strength, and show it. Show everybody. Um, I think for me, there are just two things. One is like, because I'm a worrier, like don't worry so much. Like, things will work out. Um, and the second thing is, given like several choices, I think Lindsay mentioned this actually, given, given a, like several choices, pick the one that scares you the most. Right, like the one that's the easiest is should be a big red flag, right? To avoid, <laughs> um, and pick the one that scares you the most, um, because then you'll, it's actually more exciting and fun, and and there's really not a lot of risk of downside. If you fail, what, so what, right? Like it's fine to fail. There's nothing wrong with failure. But meanwhile, you took the ride, and um, and so I think life life is for that. It's for taking risk and and. Um, I don't know, like going for things and, and reaching your potential, right? So, yeah, go after the stuff that really scares you. What a great message. So thank you so much to our panelists um, for, for giving us sort of extra uh, energy and ideas. So thank you. We actually want to take a few minutes and, and give you some, um, some gifts that we have. And I have some concluding remarks, and we have a final challenge we want to do, so hang tight. We're not quite done yet. But we do want to say thank you to Lindsay for your incredible message. Again, just resonated with so many of us. So thank you. And thank you to let's give her a round of applause. And thank you, Holly, for just helping our school become better um, and for your words of wisdom and also Paul for his mentorship here in the program. So thank you so much. All right, so you may not know this, but this is the, the fourth She's Dairy Mighty Things Summit. And every time we've asked participants to do something, um, we like to take action here at the Huntsman School of Business. and. Sometimes we have you write on stickers. Sometimes we have you share your screens when we did this virtually last year. And this year we have a goal card that I want you to take out. It's located inside of your booklet. And um, I want you to begin to think about something that you're going to do. Maybe it's your true north statement. Maybe it's a, a definitive action item that you're going to do um, based on some of, the, some of the ideas that you've heard. But what are you going to do this semester that scares you, if I can use those words um, that we heard, that is going to just help you to dare mighty? So I want you to think about that. Um, and I want to let you know that the way we're going to exit the Perry Pavilion is in, in a more orderly fashion. We're going to go table by table, because as you exit, we want you to hold up this card in front of a She's Dairy Mighty Things sign, and we want to photograph it as a way to kind of capture this moment. I don't know if you've had a chance to just look around this room. If you haven't, just look around this room. And there's actually some fellow participants in another um, classroom because we had so many who wanted to be part of this event. But this is a moment that we want to remember. Um, it is so good to know that we are part of a larger community. And this is a chance for you to sort of have an individual effort and as you're exiting, you know, table by table, take a moment to take that photograph. We'll capture that. But then also take a selfie, because I know you're really good at that. 
and post it to hashtag she's doing mighty things. Like, let's spread this out to all of Huntsman and all of USU. There is an incredible power in this room. Let's make it for a better world, a better communities that we live in, um, and help each other, help um, those uh, the, that we are, that are not here, know that they can do mighty things. Um, I also wanted to remind you that as you're leaving, there's something amazing downstairs at the courtyard. There's something called Clubs in the Courtyard, and they have some, I think, phenomenal food down there, and all of the clubs have booths. And so you can go kind of do some club shopping, if you will, and find out where you belong and where your peeps are, right? So I encourage you, if you have the time, make your way down there, get something to eat, introduce yourself to a few people, find out maybe where you fit and where you can give back here at the, at the Huntsman School. Um, let's see. So before we dismiss and before we do all of the cards, I just want to give you like a final thought um, that's really been on my mind as I've been thinking about this, this moment. And I just want to let you know that in all sincerity, I want you, each of you, to know that you belong here, right here in this room and right at Huntsman, getting the education that will help you lay the foundation for a career, right? That you can have those top jobs that we've talked about, that you can um, navigate your own business, right? that you can um, find your true north and then stick to that. Um, so hopefully at these tables, you've had a chance to connect with these amazing mentors and faculty members. They're here to support you. And um, don't be shy about looking someone up and finding their office hours or emailing them. That's a differentiator that you should take advantage of that happens here at the Huntsman School. And so we want you to succeed. And so come talk to us. We'll give you advice or we'll just encourage you and listen. That's some of the best stuff that we can do, for sure. So um, remember that you belong here at Huntsman and to Dare Mighty Things. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to write down your challenge. Maybe share it with your mentor who's at your table. And then um, we will dismiss table by table, OK?